I'll just give people a second to start trickling in. Awesome. Oh, already so many people. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Green Apple Books virtually. My name is Casey. I'm a bookseller um, at Green Apple Books on the Park, where we normally host our live in-person events. Right now, obviously, everything's virtual. Hopefully soon we'll be back in store, but thank you for joining us virtually for the time being. We're so excited to have everyone here. Um, before we get started with tonight's events, I, um, I just wanted to give a couple housekeeping announcements. I wanted to let you know about a couple upcoming events that we have planned. So this Thursday, we are going to be partnering with Litquake to host Gabriela Garcia in celebration of her debut novel of Woman and Salt, and she'll be joined by Melissa Rivero. The event is free, but Litquake um, is requiring registration via Eventbrite, so be sure to register using the link in the event listing on the website. And um, we're also thrilled to welcome Jeff Vandermeer back to Green Apple virtually um, this coming Monday for his new release, Hummingbird Salamander. He will be in conversation with Maria Devana Headley, and the event is ticketed. So again, check our website for details. And we have a full schedule of events. We have tons of events. Many of them are free. And we have Zoom links and all the information you need, again, on our website, greenapplebooks.com event. We also have recordings of many of our past events on our YouTube channel which is just Green Apple Books on YouTube. So with all that said, um, tonight we're very excited to celebrate the release of Gold Diggers. Um, it's a magical realist coming of age novel about immigrant identity, community, and the underside of ambition from debut author Sanjana Safian, which is out today. So congratulations. Um, and it's, it's been named a best book of April by Bustle, Entertainment Weekly, Good Morning America, and many more. It's also, there's a television adaptation in the works with Mindy Kaling attached, which is amazing news. So um, congratulations, <laughs> and I'm so excited to hear more about it. And by the way, um, everybody watching, if you have questions for the authors tonight during the discussion, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A function, which is separate from the chat. We are opening up the chat, so if you want to chat amongst yourselves during the event, please feel free to do that and be respectful and everything. And if you have questions directly for the authors, you can put them in the Q&A box so they can answer them and find them easily there. So I think with all that, all that said, oh yeah, and if you wanna buy a copy of Gold Diggers, you can do that on our website, greenapplebooks.com and make sure to request a signed copy on your order comments because we will have some signed book plates to include in those orders for you. So with all that said, I'm excited to introduce you to our guest tonight. Um, in conversation with Sanjana is Pooja Bhatia. Pooja has written or edited for the San Francisco Chronicle, London Review of Books, the New York Times, The Economist, and many other publications. She has received writing fellowships from the Institute of Current World Affairs, Yaddo and McDowell. She is a former human rights law lawyer and is currently working on a novel set in Haiti where she lived for many years. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to the author of Gold Diggers, Sanjana Safia. A Paul and Daisy Soros fellow, Sanjana is a 2019 graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop. She has worked as a reporter in Mumbai and San Francisco with nonfiction bylines for the New Yorker, the New York Times, Food and Wine, the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, and more. And her award-winning short fiction has been published in Boulevard, Joyland, Salt Hill, and the Master's Review. Sanjana and Pooja, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Casey. Um, so I think we're going to start with a little bit of a reading. Um, I already see a few people saying hi in the chat, so please keep saying hi. Um, I'm so excited to be launching Gold Diggers um, at Green Apple Books, a bookstore that I really, really miss um, from my San Francisco days. Um, and to be back here with Pooja, who is um, one of my longtime readers and also was one of the first readers of Gold Diggers and saw it through its many incarnations. Um, I am gonna read from uh, a section at the start of part two, um, because it's set in San Francisco, it's set in the Bay Area. Um, the only context you really need for this is that the first half takes place in suburban Atlanta um, and these same characters later land up in, uh, in San Francisco. Um, and the narrator in this section, Neil Narayan is now uh, 26. Something strange was happening to my family. Of late, the Narayan definition of success had morphed. 
This was not to say my parents supported my professional choices. In the summer of 2016, I was piddling around as a student of history, suffering their disdain. No, rather they had accrued additional expectations, ones I did not discover until my sister Prachi fulfilled them. Shadi, 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 my mother kept squealing, the Hindi word for marriage. She declaimed the triplicate in times of both exuberance and distress, in much the way my nani used to utter the name of the Lord, Narayana, 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 in prayer. So long we have waited for this shadi, 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 when Prachi first waggled her conflict-free diamond. This is a shadi, 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 not some country club buckhead Betty nonsense, denouncing my sister's plan to wear a white lenga rather than the traditional red and gold sari. My mother broadcast her daughter's impending nuptials to her clients. When I was in college, she had begun a second faded career as a realtor. The wedding talk helped close the deal in much the way the scent of freshly baked cookies in an on the market house does. The general whiff of familial completion is infectious, makes everyone hot for suburban settling. Preparations for Prachi's shadi 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 were even impinging on my life on the West Coast. Our parents remained in Georgia, but my sister and I had each made our way to California by way of the tech bubble and academia, respectively. She lived on the third floor of a converted Victorian in San Francisco, and I in a cannabis-infused walk-up in Berkeley. And on a particularly foggy day in June, my roommate Chidi and I were running late to a party at said Victorian. We stood by Alamo Square Park, taking in the vast bay windows of Prachi's nearly three grand a month apartment while I sucked on my vape. I discerned the shadows of her friends moving about on the other side of those cake-like window trimmings, and something about their shapes startled me. I told Prachi, in trying and failing to beg off that night, that I was spending my summer ensconced in my dissertation and couldn't be disturbed. In truth, I had no coherent justification for the social skittishness that had become my norm. Yes, there was the mounting pressure of graduate school, but there was also some other general allergy that erupted most acutely when I was surrounded by the hyperopic residents of my sister's version of San Francisco. None for me. I'd like to be on tonight, Chidi said, virtuously refusing a hit of my sativa indica blend, which made me anxious that I'd already begun. It's a useful skill to be able to walk into any room and get along with people, Neil, especially in a room with a collective net worth of, he frowned, doing mental math, call it tens of millions. He rubbed his hands together gleefully, prepared as always to charm, persuade, finagle, and fundraise. If you thought more creatively, you could get one of these people to endow you a chair one day, or really rethink the concept of a university, bring it into the 21st century. I was already walking away. Upstairs inside, we found the room arranged by twos. It reminded me of the opening of those Madeline books Prachi read growing up. 12 little couples in two straight lines. In two straight lines, they talked tech shop. They ate their brie. They swirled their wine. The betrothed, Avi Kapoor, tapped on his phone while Prachi, next to him, picked at red grapes and chatted with one of her Duke's sorority sisters. Chidi shook hands with Avi, whom he knew from incestuous elite tech circles. I own our tardiness, Chidi lied to the happy couple on my behalf. I dozed through the afternoon following a late night out with the girl I'd been sleeping with. I remembered little of the prior evening's party, save the hot gas station whiff of coke and a dreadlocked guy wearing a vial of ketamine around his neck, plucking solemnly at a sitar. My call with Fabian Fisher ran long, Sheedy went on. He sends his best, Avi. Sheedy had dropped out of Caltech when a billionaire awarded him $100,000 to pursue a 3D printing venture. He'd since launched a wetware product dealing with longevity that is, attempting to prolong the human lifespan to Old Testament proportions. He lived off a uniquely Californian income in the interim, exit money from the first company's sale, supplemented with Bitcoin investments. He was half Nigerian, the product of an Oakland Hills secular Jewish mother and a Lagos transplanted doctor. And I attributed all differences between us, his proclivity for risk, his openness with his parents to the non-immigrant side. 
Avi appeared duly impressed. Are you guys raising? I'm surprised you're out. Then to me, book going okay, Neil? Dissertation, a book implies someone's going to read it. It's coming. At that time, I was going to be an Americanist, a professional interpreter of this land and its layers. My specialty was to be late 1800s California with a focus on the rise of immigration, the ballooning of enterprise and the economic stratifications that buoyed the nation into the 20th, 21st, 20th century. In other words, the aftermath of the gold rush. But these days, staring at the papers piling up on my desk, I couldn't imagine spending decades burrowing into this corner of the past. It didn't help that I stood out in this land of utopian techno-futurists, committed as I was to the secular preservationist priesthood that is the History Academy. You know, Prachi said, we just hired an ex-academic from Berkeley for my team. She fumbled for her name, then remembered. I knew the woman. Oh, she's an ABD, all but dissertation, I clarified at Prachi's quizzical expression. The ABD wasn't the first to flee the academy for big tech six figures and office nap pods and wouldn't be the last. The specter of dropping out, burning out, loomed over my life and the lives of many in my cohort. Few of us would land where she had. Without Berkeley, I was a Southern State School grad with two years of debate coaching on my resume. Prachi, ha, huh, that sounds like ABCD. No one had applied that acronym. American-born confused Daisy to me in quite some time. We'd grown out of it as we grew up. Our generation had perhaps not resolved, but had at least begun to get over that riddle. What does it mean to be both Indian and American? Avi chortled. Drop the C and you're an ABD. You could follow her to the big bucks. I think I'll remain confused for now. Uh, that's so wonderful. I love that so much. Um, uh, this question about what does it mean to be Indian and like also American uh, kind of repeats through the book in a bunch of different ways. And originally Sanjana and I, when we were thinking about today, um, we were thinking that we would do a setup of a joke um, where I would ask her, so Sanjana, what does it mean to be like Indian and also American? And she would kind of hold up her book, her novel. Um, well, I wanted to say, uh, first of all, um, congratulations, Sanjana. This is an amazing novel. Um, I think that, uh, and it's it's meeting with a ton of success. I just looking at the attendees here, I know that a lot of them, or at least some of them know you. And I think that those who know you can say like, I do that the success is completely and richly deserved and we're all really happy. Um, and I'm really excited for all of you to be able to um, read the book because it's marvelous. It's really marvelous. Um, I wanted to just share with you um, a few words from the reviewer at the Washington Post, Ron Charles, um, who had this really um, like rave review today. Um, I'm just gonna read the first couple of sentences and I think the last sentence. Um, Sanjana Sethian's Gold Diggers is a work of 24 karat genius. Um, this remarkable debut novel melts down striving immigrant tales, old West West mythology, and even madcap thrillers to produce an invaluable new alloy of American literature. Um, and then his last sentence, and this is quite the kicker. Looking up from the pages of the sparkling debut, I experienced something like the thrill the luckiest 49ers must have felt. Gold, gold, gold. Um, I think that that exuberance is just wonderfully deserved. Um, um, so yeah, um, I, I th and I wanted to thank everybody for coming today too. Um, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, I wondered if we could start, Sanjana, if you could tell us a little bit about the genesis of this novel. Um, it's a really exuberant novel. There are a whole bunch of things um, uh, that you, that kind of make it up, um, ranging from 
alchemy to ambition, belonging, theses in America, history, um, what it means to write history, the transformation of the American suburbs. But there are two aspects of it that strike me as really novel um, uh, and even improbable. So one of them is alchemy, um, uh, this um, the kind of mechanism at the center of the novel. Um, and then the other is the insistence on writing they seize Indians into America's history way more than a century ago, way more than is commonly understood. So perhaps we could start with the gold. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, um, about um, you know, what Neil and some others in the book are engaged in doing with the gold? Sure, yeah. Um, so one or there are kind of two different origin stories for the novel. Um, the first is that eight years ago, I was writing um, one of several kind of failed and doomed novels about the Atlanta suburbs where I grew up. Um, because the further I got away from the Atlanta suburbs, the more I realized that these sort of like little bubbles of Indianness that I grew up kind of with one foot in and one foot out of, I realized that those were like a community worth chronicling. Um, but I had a lot of difficulty finding a voice and a story that like made sense to chronicle them. Um, so I had thrown away a few things, but I was interested generally in writing about that world and that place. Um, I really only found a way back into it um, maybe five years later, so a few years ago, when I started writing mostly speculative fiction. Um, and so people who haven't read the book, like it is a magical realist story sort of wedged into a socially realist novel. Um, and in speculative fiction, which kind of just means non-real stuff, so everything from sci-fi to magic, um, it just gave me a way into the real. It was, um, I read somewhere that it's about kind of betraying the truth to tell the truth. And so when I started to have speculative conceit, all of a sudden I could play in a new way. And so the speculative conceit at the heart of Gold Diggers, um, and this doesn't give anything away that's not already out there, um, is that um, Neil, who you just heard from, and his best friend and longtime crush, Anita, start stealing gold from uh, other Indians in the Atlanta area. And that stolen gold ends up having some magical properties that allow them to steal the ambitions of the gold's original owners. Um, and that particular idea kind of came from a spate of gold thefts that I knew had happened in Atlanta and in a bunch of other suburbs. Like I think it happened in New Jersey, in Texas. I think it happened in the Bay Area or in Fremont. Um, and there were people outside the community who were held criminally responsible for it. But I remember um, my mom, and my mom is on here somewhere, so maybe she'll have a different memory of this, but I remember her saying, like, there are Indians involved in this because these criminals, they, like, know exactly where in the house to go. They know where people keep the gold. They know that there are these, like, giant suitcases in the guest bedroom wedged under the guest bed where people keep, like, five and ten thousand dollars worth of gold, and so I, yeah, Pooja's got to go lock up her house after this. But I was really interested in the idea that there could be people within the community who belonged enough to know where the where the stuff was kept, but also felt um, motivated enough to want to betray the community. Um, and that kind of gave me um, a way in. And then drinking of the gold, um, it's kind of this idea that if you drink someone else's gold, gold, you imbibe her, like almost like a piece of her soul. Um, and definitely some ambition is what um, is what we see a lot of in the novel. But d does that have any um, any root in Hinduism or um, uh, is that just totally made up? I mean, I had the contemporary conceit um, uh, that sort of just like, came to me in this like dreamlike fashion. And I was like, this is fun, they'll drink the gold. And then I started doing a lot of research um, into alchemical traditions from China to India to Europe. And I found these um, passages from Vedic texts that end up being the epigraphs of part one that suggest that 
consuming gold was like a preoccupation people had and have had over a long period of time. Um, gold has always meant something more than its economic value. It has signaled, you know, it's, it's, it's untarnishable metal. Um, it's really hard to make from scratch. So it suggests more. It suggests something like spiritually more, not just economically more. Um, and so the idea that people have been trying to consume gold and consume the values of gold for centuries is like, it's very true. And I didn't know that when I started writing. Um, oh, that's fascinating. I like that um, the phrase that you used, betraying the truth to reveal the truth. And that actually is a nice seg segue to um, uh, Neil work as a historian. Um, so during the, in, in the course of the novel, in the second part of it, Neil becomes obsessed with a story that he heard when he was a teenager um, about uh, Bombay, he calls it his Bombayan. He heard about um, an Indian in California during the 1849 gold rush. Um, and as a historian, he becomes kind of obsessed with finding um, evidence for this story. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why it's so important for Neil to um, find this story. Yeah, I mean, I should say that some of that, again, is rooted in reality. Um, I already had the contemporary conceit for the novel. I knew that I was writing about Indian American gold thieves in 2006 and 2016. And then I thought I would like to include something um, that involved history, because some of my favorite novels from All the King's Men to Ruth Ozeki's A Tale for the Time Being, they have this sense of history about them. And so I knew the novel was going to involve that. So I started doing research um, into the sort of aforementioned alchemy that I was talking about, but also into uh, the gold rush, because um, of course, like that's gold in the American imagination. Um, and I knew that the gold rush was an international phenomenon. Like we know that Chileans and Chinese people and Australians all came to the US seeking gold. Um, there aren't that many stories about Indians seeking gold though. And I found one tale in a, like a travelogue written by a German man about this Bombayan gold digger. Um, that's what the, the German writer calls him. Um, who appears to be someone from India who is accused of stealing gold. And it's actually kind of a, it's a really dark story because it's a story of a lynch mob of this um, Indian man who is accused of being a thief and chased down by just this phalanx of white man, white men who cannot communicate with him um, and who just blame him. And I remember feeling so shaken when I read that story, um, both first by like tragedy that I had no idea who this man was. Um, I spent about a year and a half kind of trying to track this figure down, seeing whether or not he might have been real, whether it could have been someone misunderstood as Indian, um, and I couldn't find him. Um, but I was also in addition to being just sad that he was nameless and lost to history as is the case for most people whose you know, countries have been colonized. Um, I also felt this like jolt of recognition of, I had spent you know, years thinking about American literature and American history. And it kind of always started with like George Washington and bloody footprints in the snow in the Revolutionary War. And it, it never involved Asian American history definitely not South Asian American history. And so I was trying to hold these dual things of like a blast of recognition combined with real tragedy that I would never know the specifics. Um, and Neil becomes infected with those same feelings. He, he wants so badly to under, understand himself as like a rightful inheritor of the American tradition of American history. Um, but until he can name this figure, until he has the specifics, of this person's story. Um, he just feels lost and like he doesn't actually belong to an American tradition. Um, the conventional wisdom is that, or well, I mean, most it is the case that the vast majority of Indian immigrants in the United States came after 
the 1965, the passage of the 1965 Immigra Immigration Nationality Act, which opened up um, the country to um, Asians. There had been very harsh quotas um, against immigration before. Um, had you known, and both of our parents came that way, they came post-1965, had you had an inkling of, the, of, of an Indian presence in the United States before, um, uh, before that, before that time? When did that inkling start to come to you? And I guess I wanted to ask a little bit more about the German travelogue. Do you remember where you found it? Um, were you like your, your protagonist who kind of um, hears this story and then tries where did you hear it basically? I found it in like a Library of Congress archive. Um, and I, I rely a lot on the South Asian American Digital Archive, um, which is an amazing resource for anyone who wants to know more about South Asian history, um, South Asian American history. But a lot of my understanding of um, South Asian American history it actually started when I was living in the Bay Area. Um, I regret that I didn't get like almost a lick of Asian American history until I sought it out in my early 20s. You know, I all I really remember is learning about Japanese internment. I don't think we even covered the Chinese Exclusion Act in any of the history classes I ever took, and that was kind of a lot. Um, and uh, when I moved to San Francisco, I remember learning a little bit about the history of um, South Asian Americans who were activists and anti-colonial agitators who lived in San Francisco and in Berkeley at, in the early 20th century. And a lot of them were, it was this kind of combination of sick farm workers and um, students at Berkeley. Um, a lot of it I learned about from uh, documentarians like Vivek Bald um, and uh, those of you who are in Berkeley or the East Bay in the Bay Area period who have not taken the radical South Asian history walking tour um, you have to do it because it kind of chronicles these stories. But I remember kind of a similar feeling when I learned that, you know, I was living in Potrero Hill and there had been this like whole community in the Presidio, like two bus rides away from me uh, that had involved people agitating against the British crown, um, this like movement of Indians abroad. I just remember again, feeling kind of shaken and being like, well, we were here we are a part of the American story. Um, and that was freeing, but it was also frustrating to know that I hadn't known it, that I had spent a decade plus engaging with American history and never being told this. Um, and a very, very different, um, a very, very different time, a very different um, sort of political posture than a lot of the Desis who came um, after 1965. Um, uh, Oh, I wondered actually if you can read a little bit um, to, to that idea of, you know, this conventional wisdom about when um, South Asians started to come to the United States. I wonder um, to that point if you could read um, a couple of paragraphs on pages 91 and 92. Yes, this is the generational gap. Okay. Uh, yeah, where they're like the essays, right? Okay. okay. So this is in part one when um, Neil is 15 years old um, in Georgia and he lives in a suburb called Hammond Creek. Perhaps sensing the generational gap between the youth of Hammond Creek and their forebears, my English teacher, Ms. Rabinowitz, an eager Bostonian transplant, decided our curriculum ought to include several short stories depicting the somber reality of the immigrant experience. Through these pieces, we learned that old people looking out windows symbolize nostalgia for their former nations. We learned that images of springtime symbolized youth, and we hypothesized that the changing of the leaves might imply a metamorphosis from foreign to American, or perhaps from life to death. Having inspired us to discern the signs and signifiers that surrounded us, Ms. Rabinowitz told us to interview a family member as inspiration for our own heritage creative writing pro process. Let me nod to my teacher's intentions. It was 2006 and one of my classmates bore the unfortunate name Osama Hussein. Much of what Ms. Rabinowitz did in that course seemed to be driven by an implicit desire to redeem the nomenclative tragedy. Osama for his part was thriving. He'd recently talked his way out of a few class skipping charges by claiming he was fleeing Republican bullies, 
when in fact he had driven off campus to buy weed from his college aged brother. I love that it also gives us a sense of um, uh, Hammond Creek circa 2006. Um, uh, which is a very specific milieu and i'm wondering uh, hammond creek is the name of the suburb of atlanta or is it the subdivision i forgot yeah it's a it's a fictional suburb yeah um uh where neil and um other major characters live at least at the beginning of the novel um so you grew up in atlanta or around atlanta like neil and what i'm wondering is whether the neighborhood that you grew up in was like hammond creek um, you know, you describe this landscape of strip malls with, um, you know, uh, various Asian restaurants and um, uh, dosa places and um, nail salons and mainly or like um, eyebrow threading, etc. Um, was that was it kind of dense with daisies when you were growing up? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you were saying about um, your parents. So they arrived in sort of that first wave um, when there were not as many Indians coming to the US. Um, when my parents came in the 80s, um, they would have been about like, there would have been about half a million um, Indians um, emigrating to the US, if I remember my statistics correctly. And people just have kept coming since. Um, so the diaspora has been growing. And I, that meant like I grew up as the diaspora grew and kind of settled into itself. Um, Hammond Creek is sort of an amalgam of a bunch of suburbs um, in Atlanta. I grew up in the suburbs very much in a, in a suburb called Dunwoody. And we had a lot of friends who lived out in the suburbs as well. But I think I kind of had one foot in like white Atlanta and one foot in very Asian American Atlanta. Um, it felt like we, like my brother and I went to school in these really white contexts. Um, uh, but then we had these sort of sub communities of other Indians. Um, and uh, that felt like a sort of like refuge, but it also felt like we were kind of both doubled and split. Like there was the self who you were when you were attending Indian parties and like dressed up in a kurta and a langa and like taken to the temple always unwillingly. Um, versus who you were when you were on AIM with your friends and you were like trying to go to the mall and sort of live what you thought of as an American life. Um, and I think, I think that is kind of the experience of being immigrant in a lot of suburbs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's definitely different than my growing up um, 15 years before that in Iowa, um, which was which I don't think is very dense with Daisy's now, but certainly was it when I was there. Um, no, having and that, I mean, that is one thing that we were talking about earlier. I was just talking about um, the Indian American novel kind of growing up or fiction growing up. Um, what we had, you know, the kind of paragon of the form, I guess, the voice, the voice. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago was Jhumpa Lahiri, whose stories, whose characters are often very, um, very lonely um, and very, um, uh, you have a sense of their removal from communities. Um, you have a sense of their longing, this ache that will never be sort of, um, that will never be um, uh, assuaged. Um, but in your case, I mean, in Neil's case, um, if anything, you know, instead of, you know, being sort of discomfited by silence and disconnection, Neil has the opposite problem. He's sort of um, in the middle of a community that just won't shut up. <laughs> there's a lot of talking, there's a lot of gossip. Um, um, wait, I'm actually, I wondered if we could actually go back to um, uh, back to Hammond Creek for or back to the, what was the name of your, the town that you grew up in? Dunwoody was the suburb. Um, another character, uh, Anita, who's a main character, uh, she, uh, she kind of dresses up for Halloween when she's nine or 10 or 11, you know, wearing in these like power suits. She's got these like shoulder pads. She's a very strong sense of what she wants to be. And that is, 
you know, successful and this very kind of capitalist notion of success, which is like making lots of money and ambition in this um, uh, kind of soulless way, I guess. Um, I wonder, when, were you, um, were you, did you have an idea of what you wanted to be when you were Anita and Neil's age? Um, I mean, in one sense, I always wanted to be a writer because I was a reader. Um, and I can remember having kind of an assuredness about that from a really young age. Um, did you, did you yeah. dress up as a writer for Halloween? No, I didn't dress up. I think I was like an Indian princess, like every brown girl ever, like, like you got to make use of the Indian stuff in your wardrobe so you're like sort of Princess Jasmine but not um I did not know this was like a universal experience I think until I watched Tessa Minaj um in adulthood but um yeah no I mean I think you were the one who actually helped me understand that like the concept of imagination was a through line in the book um Anita, um, who is Neil's childhood best friend, neighbor, literally the girl next door, um, when they're growing up, they, they play a lot of games of house. They're imaginative kids. They're playful. And Anita has this rich imagination. But as she gets older, um, when the novel picks up in the first half, she's a high schooler. And all of that imaginative power is directed toward kind of a narrow idea of achievement and success. And I do think that's like kind of an accurate description of a lot of bubbles of the particular Indian America that I come, come from, which is to say dominant caste, upper middle class. Um, that, that is an experience that seems to be prevalent, um, that the, all of the power you have to kind of imagine the future, um, it's less playful and more like survival instinct. Um, and I don't begrudge anyone that kind of hustle because I had it for a reason. Um, and the reason is it's the only way you know to imagine your future um, when you have a little bit of a limited picture of what American identity is. You like, you, you don't have roots here. You don't have like a million family friends who are, living the van life or like being creative and like teaching Montessori you just have like a lot of people all feeling like their decision to come here uh is going to be validated or not validated by how successful their kids are um yeah and successful in this very sort of limited way um I mean you Obviously, you have very much forged your own path. It's a very risky thing to be a novelist. Um, uh, uh, I would, I, but there's a there's a part in the book where Neil kind of realizes. Well, he's thinking about ambition a lot, and he's like, "What's the difference between ambition and greed?" Um, and you are certainly very ambitious. Um, I would not describe you as greedy. I would describe you as a generous person. Um, I wonder how you think about, um, I wonder how you think about that, how you think about balancing your own ambition. I know that you're very competitive. Um, you have to be very driven to sort of, um, to achieve this kind of thing. I know how hard you worked. Um, and uh, how do you, how do you think about that versus, you know, being a human and being like, you also are very, you know, you're, you, you read, you teach, you read other people's work. Um, you're a very generous commenter. You um, are. Um, uh, you teach a lot of classes. Um, how do you think about holding those things in balance? Your own ambition with generosity. Um, I mean, I think there's like two answers. Uh, I I can't really talk about my own like generosity or not. I'll talk about the characters in the book, but. I think when I started writing this book, I was writing about, I was writing characters, right? And so I was writing characters who were ambitious and then saw how their ambitions had really ugly consequences and how they did damage to themselves and to others. I think as I stepped away from the book in order to like do revisions, like it, it sort of existed, I stepped away, I would re-enter it and it was like kind of a fully formed world and I had to move within it in revisions. During that process, I sort of stopped blaming a lot of these characters for their own conditions and like their own set of choices and saw how like they were 
necessitated by circumstance. Um, it's like there's a, a sort of comically intense uh, girl who Neil uh, debates with named Wendy, who has like a lot of the intensity that I had when I was a high school debater. Um, and she, all she cares about is getting into Harvard. And Neil is like, what's gonna happen when you get to Harvard? And she's like, whatever I want to. And she's both right and not right. Like she's, she's incorrect in that like, it's not enough to dream of just getting there. But she's also correct to realize that there is like social power and economic power and privilege that comes from getting into those places. And so I think it becomes really important to like situate all of these characters in their systemic context, which is like, they're trying to operate within economic and political systems that like, create immigration policy that cause us all to a lot of the Indians who got here after 1965 to have similar highly educated backgrounds and then compete against one another. Like that we are all a product of this kind of artificial um, and engineered diaspora, um, that it's not like individual failures all the time as much as it is like a, a system that we need to understand. Um, I'm seeing a question in the chat, I think. Oh, by the way, um, uh, if you have specific questions for Sanjana, you can put them in the Q and A, um, which is not the same thing as the chat. We can we can kind of try to look at the chat for um, questions as well, but it would be easier if you put them in the Q and A. And one of the questions I saw actually in the chat was about writing from the male perspective. Um, you have a first person narrator who's a guy, um, even though the book is, you know, it's to me, it's one of the one of the big things that it's about is about mother daughter relationships. Um, can you talk about that choice to write um, from uh, a male perspective and uh, what it was like? Yeah, so um, initially, uh, I knew the story was going to be about a mother and a daughter who were stealing gold. So kind of to bring it back to that question you asked earlier, um, who were the gold thieves, like the sort of genesis, I imagined, okay, we've got a mother who is um, a caterer, she cooks in other people's homes, she has access to other people's jewelry, that was one character, and then I imagined her daughter getting involved. And so that was the sort of start of this world and this conceit. But whenever I wrote from the perspective of either that mother or that daughter, it just, things were clunky. It felt really overly somber and sort of too self-serious. And I actually turned in a short story version of the conceit to, um, to my workshop um, in graduate school. Um, and it just really didn't land. It was from the perspective of an older Anita who was looking back on like her years stealing gold with her mom. Um, but there was a, a, a character in the periphery of the story who was a guy um, who I just got interested in. And I was like, what would it be like if the story were told from his perspective? And I started writing from his perspective and all of a sudden I just felt like more like me. Um, uh, maybe that means I have like a bit of Holden Caulfield in me um, from Catcher in the Rye, but like I just, a lot of me apparently comes out like a 15 year old boy. So I don't know what that says about me, but it just felt more natural. Only the best thing, Sanjana. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me see what time is it 6 44 yeah we've got a bunch of people in the in the yeah group. we should do that actually do you Sanj, do you want to look and see if there are any questions that you want to take oh man um, that you particularly want to take there are a lot here yeah there are a bunch um uh you can you can feel free to to push in. I see one from Oriel um, uh, about what got left out of the finished book, um, and the answer is a lot. I am a vomit drafter, um, as my professor in college Anne Fadiman taught me to call it, which means I produce hundreds of pages for every like five that I keep. Um, stuff that got cut included like pages and pages and pages from other characters' perspectives, but it's a first person novel. It's told from Neil's perspective. So those sections were there to sort of fill in these other characters. So I kind of had to know them all as well. And then there was like basically a full other historical fiction novella 
um, set in 1914 that was, it just didn't belong in this book, um, but it involved some of that history that I was talking about earlier. Um, it had absolutely nothing to do with this book, so it really had to go, but that was like 90 pages that maybe I'll make use of at some other point. Uh, was it tough to let go of it? Um, I sort of knew I was gonna have to let go of it um, as I was writing it. Um, I think one thing about being a vomit drafter is you know not to be super attached to your work um, because you know a lot of it is just gonna, like it's like a process of discovery. Um, yeah. Um, oh, Charlotte has a question. How did, okay, so just a little background. Um, Sanjana lived in the Bay Area. While she was here, she was um, a reporter and she reported on Silicon Valley. And there's, um, I think that those of us who worked with Sanjana at that time will see a lot of, um, we'll see at least some of the things that she was obsessed about as a journalist uh, in her novel. Um, Charlotte uh, has a question about, she was also that she was then a correspondent in India. Um, how did living in India change your thoughts about what kind of book you wanted to write? Um, yeah, I think I used to always reach a, a point in writing novel length projects. Um, and as I said, I tried and failed to write several before this one. I would, I would be able to write this contemporary section set in the US, and then I would reach a point where I knew I had to go go back to the old country for the narrative to make sense. And I always got stuck there. And I got stuck there because even though I'd grown up visiting India and I actually think I had kind of a relationship with it, I didn't know it well enough to say anything about it. Um, it just always felt like I was writing through through other writers. Like I was writing knockoff Arundhati Roy or knockoff Salman Rushdie and you just like can't imitate writers like that. But um, the book opens in Bombay. It has some sections in Bombay. It is not actually like my, the Bombay I lived in that filters into these pages. Um, I did a lot of, um, I spent some time interviewing my uncle um, who lives in Saratoga, who attended IIT Bombay, the um, engineering school there, um, and whose experiences like I just sort of stole rudely um, and you know then mutated and morphed for my own purposes. But I think one thing that living in India gave me is it just gave me an appreciation that like, I could talk to my uncle about what his years in his twenties had been like, what his college experience was like, and realize that it wasn't so untranslatable, that it wasn't so different from my own years. Like it gave me this relatability and I feel quite at home in Bombay. So even though this is 1980s Bombay that appears in the book, um, uh, my own experience like made it more relatable. Um, let's see, uh, do you want to, do you want to talk about the Esporic novels of, um, what, it, what your relationship with those narratives is like? Yeah, um, I mean, I think we covered a little bit of that in that kind of passage, which is like, we've had a lot of novels about first generation loneliness, um, but like I am second generation. And so I experienced a version of that loneliness, but that like, I'm, I'm not the generation who had to leave everything behind and come here. Like I'm the generation who could be brattier because I felt like I was an American and like my identity was being stifled or something. And I, I think that there's like more, there's like less dignity in the second generation, but there's also more opportunity for comedy. And so, part of what I had to do in order to feel comfortable writing a second generation like American novel is realize that I like didn't have to write the kind of like noble first generation story that I think a lot of diasporic literature has come to signify. Um, and that meant just like embracing irreverence. Um, a lot of that came from um, reading a book like um, The Buddha of Suburbia by Hannah Qureshi, um, which is such a rude, irreverent body uh, novel of a second generation um, kid, uh, bisexual, biracial, growing up in London. Um, novels like that, that were more about the aftermath of migration than the actual experience of migration. 
Um, I mean, sort of, sort of a, a segue. A, there's a graceful segue to the to this question from Lauren, um, who is curious to hear what other writers you consider yourself in conversation with, writing alongside, um, dead or alive. Yeah. So I always give the nod to Hanif Qureshi because I think that book is so essential um, to me. Um, the actual like structural corollary for Gold Diggers was All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren, which nobody seems to read anymore, but it is truly like one of the great American novels. Um, I think I read it because I grew up in the South. Um, uh, but but that's like structurally one, one corollary. But I mean, ultimately, like I wrote my undergrad thesis on Zadie Smith. Um, and I, I read, I started reading Philip Roth only in grad school, which is sort of mind blowing to me now um, that I got to him so late. But I think a lot about Zadie Smith and Roth as like these two novelists who both became interested in sort of chronicling a kind of collective experience, um, whether it was like Jewish American life in New Jersey or like biracial life in London um, and who kind of followed that through in like multiple different like artistic iterations. And the idea that they had just a central identity concern kind of driving a lot of their work, but then they were formally playful in how they answered that question over the course of a career, like that's very inspiring to me. And I, I think a lot about them. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah has a question about who, about some of the non-literary artists that inspired you as you were working on the novel. Oh, I presume that meant, um, like visual. I, I wish I had more of a language for non-narrative art forms, but I don't have like a great language for visual art. Um, I, I, I will say that, um, I think a lot about film, but I, th I do think that's kind of close to, um, to literature, um, I don't know. I don't know that Gold Diggers is like particularly in conversation with any of these artists, but when I was living in Iowa, I was like, there was nothing to do. So I was just watching a lot of films, like going through the Criterion collection with my roommates, um, which meant like watching a lot of Bergman. Like, I think I watched Persona like three times while writing this, um, like a decent bit of Sethi Jith Ray. Um, uh, so those those people were like maybe operating somewhere in the mulch of my brain, um, but most of my I think inner texts are are like they are novels um, fundamentally. Um, Sanjay, I wonder if you can uh, actually we didn't mark this page. I didn't tell you about this page, but there's this wonderful um, uh, there's a wonderful just sort of little paragraph or two about um, about Neil's mother's ears. Do you remember where that is? I have no idea where that is. Oh, okay. Sorry. I mean, oh, wait, here, 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 here. Here, I found it. Um, page you should read it. 22. Okay, I have to read it. Do you want, if you want me to read it, I'll read it. But okay. I'm really good at reading. I can read it. Um, Gossip is to my mother what South Indian classical music is to my father. The virtuosic amalgamation of years of a community is becoming. For as long as I can remember, she has been a connoisseur of gossip, of the sounds it makes, the musicality, the overall gestalt, which is one that causes her to use the pronouns us and them in the phrases these people and our people and such people with confidence. One might call her ears, which are extremely large and loose lobed with openings to the ear canal the size of a thumbnail, the place where the Indian immigrant public sphere gathers. In between wax and bristly dark hairs, the diaspora unscatters and lodges itself in my mother's oversized hearing organs. Thanks for that. What did you want to talk about? Um, well, I think that kind of goes back to this. I, there, you know, there have been a couple of questions about um, Indian writers or Indian American writers, and you know, the kind of um, inspirations for your novel. One of the things that that um, that uh, particular paragraph reminded me, or it evokes um, very uh, very sweetly. This um, uh, is it Salim Sinai's nose? 
in Midnight's Children, you know, this like this sensory organ that stands for so much more than it actually is. And it's also kind of disgusting too, which is nice. I bet I had Midnight's Children in the back of my head when I wrote that. Um, I didn't even make that connection. But yeah, Salim Sinai has like the snot, like India in his snot. That's right, right, yeah. right, 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 right. Yeah. Just like Neil's mom has India in her ears, or at least Hammond Creek in her ears. Yeah. Um, um, Nikki, I like that Nikki asked about this cover. If I can just give a shout. So this cover, um, it took us a really long time to get to this cover, but I'm super happy about where we landed. Um, it was designed by a, um, a designers called Sky Goodies who are based in Car um, in Bombay, like right near my old house. Um, and it's based off Indian matchbox art, um, which is this kind of like kitsch, like thing that I just, I loved. Like I, I liked the idea that we would take something loud and bright and kitschy and commercial and like kind of gaudy and like grab it and reclaim it for our own purposes and like fill it in with literary objects. And I think that's like what I'm interested in doing in, with genre in some ways. Like there are, there's like a, a caper in this book. There's like a heist. Um, there's like elements of kind of like fast paced, like commercial enjoyable stories. But there's also like, I think it's like filled in with all the stuff that I love of like rich literature. And I, I think that like blending of high and low, that's so core to my sensibilities. Um, uh, someone asked me the other day, like the movies that I rewatch over and over again, and it was like adaptation and when Harry met Sally, like these, that like that is my sensibility. And I was just so grateful that the Sky Goodies um, artists like were able to blend that kind of high low um, and that we could work with Indian artists for it. Um, well, I want to, I want to talk about the cover just a little bit more because I think that that gets into some a kind of question about the publishing process or the publishing journey um, uh, for you. Um, but what I wanted to do to your point of high and low, I wondered if you could just read the first two sentences of your um, novel, not the prologue, but the first two sentences of chapter one. Oh, I think I might have it memorized. <laughs> See if it works. Um, when I was younger, I consisted of little but my parents' ambitions for who I was to become. But by the end of ninth grade, all I wanted for myself was a date to the spring fling dance, a hot one. There you go, high and low. <laughs> um, well, Sunshine, can you tell us a little bit about, um, well, I, I think if you tell us a little bit about the, um, the process of getting your book cover, because it wasn't like that was just handed to you. Um, I think that that could illuminate a little bit of, um, a little bit uh, more broadly your journey in publishing as, a, as an Indian American writer. I mean, something that I didn't totally understand is how, how much I would have to learn how to talk about my own book. Um, I think there's this like cultural picture of the writer as like lonely white man who lives on a farmhouse away from society and like you know people just celebrate his genius um and that I think that picture uh kind of comes from I mean it's it it, it was true of some writers in the 20th century but it also comes from like a society that already knew how to account for a certain kind of white male genius and so when you are a minority writer, you have to find a way to communicate um, about your book. Now, obviously, like I was really lucky in that I had a publishing team that got it when it was like a word doc. And so they also could help me communicate about my book. And I never felt like I had to tell them what I was doing, like they understood the book itself. Um, but I think you, when you're starting to like bring the thing into the world, that's when you start to have these conversations that can feel sort of otherworldly. Like, well, it's like, it's both Indian and American. So like how Indian is the cover gonna be versus how American and are we gonna like talk around its Indianness and try to pretend that my name isn't like confusing for people to pronounce or are we gonna like home in on that? This subtitle, this is like, what does it mean to be like Indian but also like American in publishing? 
good question. Um, yeah, overall, I think I, I got really lucky in that I didn't have to communicate to my own publishing team about what I wanted, but then we had all these other larger conversations about literally just like the visual signals. Um, yeah. Should we maybe do one more? Yeah. You should pick. I'm going to let you pick. Um, Okay, um, I think uh, I think this question about the nitty gritty, like what it's like to be Sanjana, what your process is like, do you write to music, like what is this vomit drafting you speak of, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, so I wrote Gold Diggers almost, yeah, entirely when I was in graduate school. So it was a very particular process for me then. Um, I had nothing else to do. Iowa was, um, no offense, Buja, not the liveliest place I've ever lived. Um, I'm from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in hopping Iowa City, I woke up and was pretty much at my writing desk um, as quickly as possible. I wrote in this like little attic with a very low ceiling that was the most magical office I'll ever have. Um, and I, was try I tried to be there by like 9 a.m., I wrote all morning, um, I would break for lunch. Um, and uh, then in the afternoon, I lived, I lived with another novelist and a poet and we would all kind of like hang out together over lunch and talk about what we were working on. And usually say like, we really hated what we were working on and we would talk through problems, um, talk through like tough sections. Um, and then, uh, you know, the afternoon was mine to maybe do more research, to read, to like grade student work. Um, and you know, then I would like try to cook or like take care of myself in some way. But I mean, I don't write to music, which was one specific thing, but I try to, I try to write in the morning and you don't become a writer by wanting to write, you become a writer by like sitting down, doing the damn work. When I'm in the heat of a thing, I try to do like a thousand words a day. Um, but that sometimes takes anywhere from like, it could take like, to, it could take an hour, it could take two hours, it could take six hours. I like, it just totally depends. Um, when I'm editing, I'm at my desk for somewhere between eight and 12 hours. Cause I can do that for, with like a lot more stamina than just writing. Well, can I ask one more question? I mean, do you have, maybe you already covered this, but what is the, what is the, um, what was the thing that you wrote on your couch in on your like purple chaise in Potrero Hill when you lived there for a couple of years? I remember that you had written a novel there. You pointed it out to me once and were like, that's where I wrote my novel. But that sounds like I thought it was good. Um, I think I gave that chaise to Nikki who is here. Um, I mean, like that was that was stuff I was writing after like days spent at a full-time job that was completely zonking me um and uh it wasn't it just wasn't very good I'm really glad that I threw it out oh, so you're not going to tell us about the juvenilia it was awful it was so awful <laughs> okay fine no no I mean advice is don't count on a single glass of red wine to separate your work day from your fiction writing day and then expect the fiction to be good <laughs> um all right let's see if we have any others uh are there any others that you want to take or um I can I can say something quick about tv since a couple of people are asking that and then maybe we should sign off because we're past the hour um but um yeah super excited about the tv adaptation we're in really early stages we're just interviewing showrunners um, and co-writers um, and hopefully it will reach series point, but but it's really early, so yeah. Sanjana has said that I can play Anjali, who's the character that you will read about. Yeah, I'm, that's not in any contract. Um, great. Thank you, Pooja, for doing this. It's very special. Thank you, Sanjana. Congratulations. Everybody buy the book and like give it as a as give it as presents. Like it's really, really a special, wonderful, hilarious book. And I love it so much. Thank yeah. you, Kisi. Yeah, for that.
amazing discussion. And yeah, we do have copies of the book. It's out today and um, you can buy it on our website and you can request a signed copy if you'd like one. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone who attended today. Thanks for all of your enthusiasm in the chat and your participation and the great questions. It was such a great discussion. Pooja, thank you for moderating such an amazing discussion. Santana, thank you for being here as well. And congratulations again. Um, yeah. Thank you. Please support Green Apple and buy from them. Really appreciate it. All right. Good night. Bye.